Shalom family, how you doing? It's your brother Ock Gibbon here, coming again from the Bible Study Hall Unleavened. And uh, this particular video here is going to be um, defining what is living from uh, the physical aspect. Okay. And I will be reading this definition. This is the common, the most common definition for living. And actually, I, this is the one I found that's the most comprehensive so far. So, and mind you, I'll be constantly updating this revelation the Creator has given me on living. So, um, I'll read to you this article on living. So, and um. I think I touched on this in my previous video, I'm not sure, but I'm just going to read this article for you. In cooking, a leaven, often called a leavening agent, a leavening agent, also known as a rising agent, is any of one of a manner, I mean, excuse me, is any of one of a number of substances used in doughs and batters that cause a foaming action. They cause a foaming action. Gas bubbles that lightens and softens the mixture. It lightens and softens. In other words, it, it, it loosens the constituency. It makes it less dexterous. You know what I'm saying? It lightens and softens. Okay. Make it the weight lighter. And to make it soften. An alternative or supplement to leavening agents is mechanical action by which air is incorporated, i.e., kneading. Kneading your dough. Leavening agents can be biological or synthetic chemical compounds. The gas produces often carbon dioxide or occasionally hydrogen. When a dough or batter is mixed, the starch in the flour, the starch in the flour, and the water in the dough form a matrix, often supported further by proteins like gluten and polysaccharides, such as pentosans or xanthan gum. The starch then gelatinizes. The starch turns to gelatin in your body and sets, leaving gas bubbles that remain. So it turns to gelatin, sets, so it gets hard and leaves gas bubbles that are left over in your body. Biological leavening agents. Chemical leavens are mixtures or compounds that release gases when they react with each other, with moisture, or with heat. Most are based on a combination of acid, usually a low molecular weight organic acid, and a salt of bicarbonate, HCO3. After they act, these compounds leave behind a chemical salt. So it leaves behind gluten. Set gluten with gases, bubbles in it, and chemical salts. This is what it leaves behind in your system after it comes out. Chemical leavens are used in quick breads and cakes as well as cookies and numerous other applications where a long biological fermentation is impractical or undesirable. Okay. So they're basically used to speed up fermentation processes that take too long for impatient people. Okay. 
We're going to go over the history of leavening. Chemical leavening using pearl ash as a leavening agent was mentioned by Amelia Simmons in her American Cookery published in 1796. Since chemical expertise is required to create a functional chemical leaven without producing off flavors from the chemical precursors involved, such substances are often mixed into pre-measured combinations for maximum results. These are generally referred to as baking powders. Sour milk and carbonates were used in the 1800s. The breakthrough in chemical leavening agents occurred in the 1930s with the introduction of monocalcium phosphate. Other leavening agents developed include sodium aluminum phosphate, dio, I mean disodium pyrophosphate, and sodium aluminum phosphates. And these compounds combine with sodium bicarbonate to give carbon dioxide in a predictable manner. Read that again. These compounds combine with sodium bicarbonate to give carbon dioxide in a predictable manner. Next section. Other leavens. Steam and air are used as leavening agents when they expand upon heating. To take advantage of this style of leavening, the baking must be done at high enough temperatures to flash the water to steam, with a batter that is capable of holding the steam until set. This effect is typically used in popovers, Yorkshire puddings, and to a lesser extent in tempura. Nitrous oxide is used as a propellant in aerosol whipped cream cans. Large densities of N2O are dissolved in cream at high pressure when expelled from the can. The nitrous oxide escapes emulsion instantly, creating a temporary foam in the butter fat matrix of the cream. Mechanical leavening. Creaming is the process of beating sugar crystals and solid fat, typically butter, together in a mixer. This integrates tiny air bubbles into the mixture. Since the sugar crystals physically cut through the structure of the fat, cream mixtures are usually further leavened by a chemical leaven like baking soda. This is often used in cookies. Using a whisk on certain liquids, notably cream or egg whites, can also create foams through mechanical action. This is the method employed in the making of sponge cakes, where an egg protein matrix produced by vigorous whipping provides almost all the structure of the finished product. The Corley Wood bread process uses a mix of biological and mechanical leavening to produce bread. While it is considered by food processors to be an effective way to deal with the soft wheat flour's characteristics of British Isles agriculture. It is controversial due to a perceived lack of quality in the final product. The pro process has nevertheless been adapted by industrial bakers in other parts of the world. Now that's the secular definition which pretty much ties into the biblical definition because I know a lot of you already saying I thought this was a Bible study um, you're talking, you reading articles and stuff. But um, the way study hall works is you need to know thoroughly what these things mean so that when we go to the scripture and read the scripture you have a greater understanding. And uh, that's basically my premise when it comes to this word living. I don't think we as believers and people in the body of believers, those, those the remnant of his seed, Israelites, we are lackadaisical when it comes to simple education. All right? And we'll jump out there and study deep stuff and 
for stuff when it comes to basic education, like grammar, uh, pronunciation, enunciation, diction, um, context, pretext, all these different aspects of just how we understand, we're lackadaisical on it. And that's, that's, in my opinion, that's why I think we argue and debate so much rather than build and edify. You know what I'm saying? Everything's an argument and a debate because there's a lack of understanding somewhere. And I don't think it's a lack of understanding or a lack of not wanting to understand. I really think it's a practical lack of not knowing how to properly understand this language that we've been forced to speak. It's been forced on us. It's been done. So we need to learn this language and learn how it applies to our captivity because it's a certain level of understanding that we have to come to using this language to even know that we need to come back to the original language. So I'm going to give you the definition of the English word Latin. Using the English word. Okay. And because that's how we was introduced to it. We wasn't introduced to none of this stuff in Hebrew. Okay. Though that's where we're going. But Latin. Actually, I just gave you an example of eleven verbally. <laughs> okay, and uh, to illustrate, that, well, I just let's just tell you all right. Anytime a person adds more to the information than you were seeking, that's verbal eleven. Eleven is adding more. It's not even adding more. Actually, it's the appearance of adding more when you actually haven't added anything. It's air. It's Fluff. It's gas. You ever heard the phrase somebody gassing you up? They just they flattering you. They're telling you, oh, oh, you're this, you're that, and they don't mean any of it. But for the effect that it's gonna give you, the person being gassed up, they do it. Why? Because it's gonna encourage you and um embolden you to do something that you don't have to do. You know what I'm saying? That you don't have to, you know what I'm saying, ascribe to. But they're gassing you up to encourage you. That's what leaven is. Leaven is gassing up bread. Okay? Leavening was something that was used to stretch the bread out so that half a measure of meal will make it look like a whole loaf. And people in the market could sell a half a loaf or a whole loaf. And it was also a way for poor people to stretch out the measures of meal that they had during famines and during lean times. That's what leaven was. It was a to get you to a certain point to where you didn't need the leaven. You could take the natural nourishment from the grains, from the bread, from the unleavened bread, and process that and get the pure intention. Okay? Leaven is something... Uh, I just put it to you like my wife put it to me earlier today. It's bread of affliction. It's bread you eat because you feel like you have to. It's bread you eat because you feel like there's nothing else to eat. And either way, it gives you no nourishment, but it pacifies your appetite so that you can go a little longer without demanding nourishment. That's what living does physically in your body, and that's what it does spiritually in your doctrine, in your belief, and anything you've accepted into your soul, into your essence, into your ruach, that's what living does. You know what I'm saying? And when it comes to air and things of that nature, we'll be wary of it. Why? Because right now, this time we're in, we're in COVID-19 times. You know what I'm saying? Um, and everybody worry about what's in the air. How can these little small particles in the air get in our body and start to grow and Manifest. You understand? Coronavirus is a form of leaven. <laughs> All bacteria, disease, microscopic particles that get in your food, your anything you may consume and put into your body is leaven. And it's inescapable to a degree. But 
it's not needed at all. But we can't escape it with the Creator, with following the Scripture, line upon line, precept on precept, like a novel. You know, one line is on top of the other line. You keep going, line on line, line on line, line on line, line. On. That's how you follow the Scripture. You don't read a line here and read a line there. No. No, that don't make sense. No way how you do you read any other book like that. But you want to get to the most important book in the world and jump all over the place and claim you got some understanding. That's a trick. That's a form of spiritual leaven. Because people take the basic scripture in Isaiah. And let me pull that up for you right quick so I can read it and show you how they take it out of context. And show you how that that is a prime example of spiritual leaven. Okay? And I'm going to show you where our people learn that trick from. And I'm going to show you where they got that doctrine and that that manner of, of doing business and, and relaying information and teaching. It's erroneous. You can't teach all over the place. Okay? But let me go to Isaiah and show you what this example of spiritual living. And I'm going to read Isaiah and then I'm going to you will be, most of you, if you're Hebrews, you've been following Hebrew um, awakening for a while. Some of you have always been awoken. You just didn't know there was other Hebrews thinking on this line of thought, but the Most High just made us all aware of each other at this time. You will know what um, the teaching that's, the doctrine that's out about in the Hebrew community, about you're supposed to teach the scripture Line on line, precept on precept, here a little, there a little. Which is true, that statement. But the way they apply it is totally erroneous and very erroneous. Okay, but uh, let me pull this up right quick. Excuse me if um, this isn't moving along as quickly as you might like. Uh, this, I'm just starting this out with these videos and stuff. I'm... A big introvert, I uh, stay to myself. Uh, I usually only interact with people on a one on one basis, but something in my spirit telling me that, you know, it's people that I haven't met yet that need to hear this message I'm giving. So I'm going to put this out here. So bear with me. Isaiah. Here we go. Isaiah 28 and 10. Isaiah 28 and 10. Example of spiritual, how spiritual living is applied. I guess you call this the exegesis on Isaiah 28 and 10. Or on living, using Isaiah 28 on, I'm going to learn, I'm a babe, I'm the one, one of the people that the creator or the Messiah, thank this Father for revealing this word to babes and unlearned. I take, that's one of the only things I take pride in, that I got the knowledge that I got from the Creator and no one else. <laughs> okay. Here we go. For precept must be upon precept. Isaiah 10, this is Isaiah 10. For, I mean, Isaiah 28, verse 10. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith he may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they will not hear. Why did, it, why did the Most High say that? This is why he said that. Verse 13. But the word of, a, of the Most High was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. So, we see right here, Isaiah 28, 10 through 13. Full context of this 
particular precept and teach it. Well, precept on precept, line upon line. And we see an example in mainly camps. You can't say this for um, isolated Hebrews, Hebrews that are not affiliated with camps because there's no uniform doctrine or uniform understanding that we can see plainly. But within the camps, we can see plainly and it's pretty much across the board, all of them. Because most camps, they come from one source, ISUPK. Okay. So, they pretty much have the same doctrine as ISUPK with a few derivatives. But they all teach this. That in order to get a proper understanding of the scripture, you must go to one text, get a precept. Okay. Close that particular text. You don't even have to necessarily get the context, just get the precept. Then go find a, a similar precept in another scripture. Okay. And then expound or exegize or elaborate or comment on that and teach off that. And they do that. They say they're doing two or three witnesses plus precept on precept. But the true meaning of that statement was a simple one, actually. If someone is reading anything with any link to it, something that you can't read in one particular soundbite, to get a proper understanding, you must read it from start to finish. That's why when people write, they write one line, upon another line, upon another line, upon another line. At no point should you stop in the middle of a narrative Go to a whole nother narrative or a whole nother part of a narrative because the scripture is actually an epic narrative. So it's many parts of this narrative. And bring it back to teach you a point that wasn't even in the scripture. Okay, that's what they do. They take two scriptures, two or three, to show you that, see, this is, this is what it is. And then they go and elaborate for hours or however many minutes they want to elaborate. Everything they said after they stopped quoting the scripture was letter. That's what letter. All they had to do was read the scripture. The word of the most heart is sharper than any two-edged sword. Ain't nothing you can, you can't sharpen it. Just recite it. That's it. Anything other than reciting the scriptures when trying to break down, a, and all, that's pretty much letter. Okay? It's not a lot wrong with living, the scripture doesn't forbid us using it completely. It just forbids us using and having living during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But that's an archetype for what was coming with the Mashiach and the situation surrounding his birth, his life, his whole life, death, and the immediate situation that happened afterwards. As far as the book of Acts and what happened with the apostles. That's what that was an archetype for. Go back and read Ezekiel, I mean, excuse me, Exodus, chapter 12. When he gives us the, the, the excuse me, the Shabbat, the holy convocation of the Passover, and he breaks it down for us and goes again in several other places in Scripture and breaks it down for us and gives us more detail. It shows us that Living is something that the Most High wants us to be constantly aware of. Constantly. Which is why the Messiah gave us those specific warnings of beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and beware of the leaven of Herod. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Something that we should be constantly aware of. Especially during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Which is the archetype of the life of the Messiah. Okay? And the Spirit is telling me this. Go tell them this now. Or I'll go tell you. Ezekiel, I mean, excuse me. Exodus chapter 12. This is where the Creator gives us the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I meant to make this video just about the definition of living. And I'm going to try to stick with my intentions <laughs> here. But um, it's 
So I'm just telling me that's not enough. They got they got that. It was simple enough. So I'm gonna go into what I had planned to be the next video and lesson right now. So I may divide it or I may not, but either way, I'm gonna give you this information right now. The, the backdrop, or I should I say the premise behind the Passover. Why did the Most High give us the Passover? Why did he save us in that manner, in that way, at that time? Why did he want us to walk this particular? Because we look at the law as something we should obey, as something that we should do. But how many of us look at the law as something we should understand? You know what I'm saying? Something that we should grasp and conceptually understand, you know what I'm saying? Something that we should understand. That's, that's all I can come up with. You know what I'm saying? Why? Do we ever ask ourselves why the most high not want us to keep the law or keep these specific laws? Well, this law of Passover, I'm going to share with you the revelation he's given me on why he wanted us to keep it this way. And why he wanted us to act this out generation after generation, so that a time will come when we would see it plainly. You know, we see a part and we know a part, but one day we're going to show you plainly, and you're going to be like, huh? I can't believe I never seen this before. I've been looking at this all these years, and I never understood why. But to show you why the Father wanted us to keep Passover the way we Exodus chapter 12. And the Most High spake unto Moshe and Aaron in the land of Mizraim, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. The beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year unto you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep, or from the goats. And you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Read that again. And you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Pay attention to that wording. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take up the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Eat it, eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof, whole lamb, roasted, rotisserie. All right? And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Most High's Passover. Passover. For I will pass through the land of Mizraim this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Mizraim, both man and beast, and against all the powers of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am a higher. I'm the most high. 
and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of its rain. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Most High throughout your generations. And ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from the people. And in the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Mizraim. Therefore ye shall observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month of the fourteenth day of the month at evening, Ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leaven, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Ye shall eat nothing leaven in all your habitations. Shall ye eat leavened bread? Ye shall eat nothing leavened in all your habitations. Shall ye eat unleavened bread? Then Moshe called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel of the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Most High will pass through and smite the Egyptians, and when he sealed the blood upon the lintel and the two side posts, the Most High will pass over the door, and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto you, your houses, to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Most High will give you according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep his service. And it shall come to pass, when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? It shall come to pass, when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Most High's Passover, who passed over, our, over the houses of the children of Israel in Mizraim, when he smote the Egyptians, the Mizraimites, and de delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Most High had commanded Moshe and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass that at midnight the Most High smote all the firstborn in the land of Mizraim, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. So I'm going I'm to stop there, because it goes on to tell you the aftermath of the Passover. Right? Um, you see how the Most High was like, you know, no seven days. I don't want to see no pay. I don't want to see no live. I'm tired of that. Seven day I want to see no letter. All right. Um. It's funny how we as a people will read 
the creator's words in the comfort of our own homes in our prayer closets in the intimate setting just us and him and we get amongst our brethren and it seems like we we lose understanding we lose lose what he teaches us. And it reminds me of a parable that the Messiah told about the seed. So I went out to cast seeds, the good seeds or some fell on stony ground, some fell in, in the road and were trampled, and some fell on good ground. And um I just want to admonish everyone that especially in these times we live in Especially why we, he's forcing us to like stay at home, not really engage with a, a lot of other people outside of him right now. You know, our personal, intimate families and him. And um, I think especially with social media, we're starting to use social media even more so as an engagement process, engagement apparatus to deal with people and, uh, you know, chop it up. I guess that's what we're doing. But uh, the most I just let me know that that's when the chaos of the world kick in. He can reach us perfectly and quickly if we would keep what he gives us when we're alone. If we would just keep those things rather than going out trying to get others' opinions on it, others uh, take, others, we call it building. But to a certain extent, we're tearing down what the Creator has built within us. You know what I'm saying? We got to stand firm that the one that started leading us will bring us to an end. You know what I'm saying? It says that um, he that begun a good work in us is faithful to perform it. You know, I, th I think that was... <laughs> okay. But anyway, somebody said that. It made sense. You know what I'm saying? But I heard it somewhere in the... Old Testament that the Most High is not like a man. He would not put his hand to the plow and not finish his labor, not finish his work. So if you got that testimony that the Most High has put his hand in your life and you know this, you know at any point in his life the Most High has put his hands on you and led you in a way that was evident, okay? Take that little nugget and know that his hand is still there. Okay? You don't need anyone else to teach you this scripture. Okay? I'm coming here sharing you revelation that I've gotten only as a result of sitting to myself and the most I dinner with me. Now I'm sharing it. I'm not I'm not attempting to really, really teach you. Because, you know, I don't know him. You don't know me. You can watch this video one time and go about your business. If you watch it at all. But I'm just sharing with you what he's giving me about living. But other than that, you don't need nobody to teach you. He will share this same information with you. If you will seek it. If you ask him, Look, Father, what is living? Can I be careful of it? Help me be more careful of it. You know, and I promise you, he, you're going to come to the same conclusion he gave me. Because he gave me this conclusion. No one was taught me this. Um, it was confirmed once I got the understanding. But I would have never known the confirmation had I not got the understanding. You understand? So, keep seeking within because that's where he is. He is within you. The kingdom of heaven does not come with observation. Neither will you say, here is the kingdom of heaven here. Or there is the kingdom of heaven there. But the kingdom of heaven is within you. So, with that being said, I'm going to leave this with you. When we're chopping it up with everybody online, you know, don't forsake what he gave you when you was online with the Most High, just you and him. Okay? Don't let that go. Even if it don't make sense, even if it just, if you don't go out into the world and let the cares of the world choke your message, you can be a seed that was fell on good soil. But why? Because that seed that fell on good soil 
was immediately germinated, took root, sprouted, started to grow and bring forth fruit. But the other ones, they were moved immediately upon being sold. You know, the one among the rocks, they didn't even have to be moved. They was in the wrong. The one in the street, they were trampled and kicked around. You know what I'm saying? But the ones in the rocks, they was just, they was in a hard, hard position. They didn't want to hear the word. So it just, they just heard it and like, oh, well, whatever. I don't want to hear that. Hard-hearted. The ones that fell in the road, the people heard it. They gladly received it. Like I said, the cares of this world came. Somebody brought something up. They mentioned something. But don't you got to do this? Don't you got to do that? Or how you going to do this and that? And what you just... You see what I'm saying? They started to care. And rather than just keep it to themselves and let the seed grow. You see what I'm saying? A lot of stuff we keep to ourselves to the most I can give it to us in a way that we can share it. Not teach it. Share it. And that way his spirit and his comfort of his ruach will teach you and comfort you in regards to it. So, um, that being said, I want to leave you shalom. Um, I didn't think my video was going to go this long. Uh, I hope it's um, coherent enough for you to get the edification and the understanding and what I was trying to share with you. Um, my next video, I hope to go into the scriptural, other scriptural references of Levin, Leviticus, different aspects of what he taught us about living and how to apply it, okay? And why he wants us to eat living, unleavened bread for a period. Basically, it's a time of the year he wants us to fast from living, okay? That's on a physical sense. Every year he wants us to at least fast from living seven days, okay? But on a spiritual sense, he wants us to fast from living. By just getting his verbatim word within ourselves without any commentary, without any exegesis from outside, no commentary from outside, no exegesis from outside, no hermeneutics whatsoever. Just him and you. The bread of life, the unleavened bread of life in you. Let it work, digest, process it, take it with some bitter herbs. That bitter herbs, that's the conviction you get when you read the bread of life. That's the bitter herbs. And it's good. That's why it's herbs. You see, all herbs is good for you, good for healing and medicine. So when you eat this bread of life and you get convicted, that's the bitter herbs. You know what I'm saying? You accept the conviction. And he goes down and he goes down, he works that out of you. That's the salvation process in a nutshell. All out of the feast of unleavened bread. And I'm gonna show you that in the next video in other aspects of the scripture. So I bid you shalom, shalom, peace, and uh stay up Israel, stay encouraged, and stay in your prayer closet. And keep what the most high share with you personally to yourself until he urges you to share with others. And believe me, you'll know because you won't get no risk. He's going to urge you to share with others. And then you'll be a reclusive person like myself stepping out here on Facebook, YouTube, wherever you step out to share this word. But he's going to bring a huge, tremendous amount of revelation and insight from obscure, reclusive, Brothers and sisters who are not articulate, who are not intellectual, who are not high-minded. Not saying that in a negative way, but people who see themselves as, you know, this is we who the Creator has sought to edify this time, okay? And he's going to do it in a way where no one can get the glory but him. So, like I said, shalom, peace. I'll be back. And y'all give me some critiques and things that might help.
me to get this message across. But I love y'all and I um, want to see all those prosper into that kingdom gloriously, singing and praising and just shaking off all this living we've been dealing with in this world. <laughs> living is hell and Satan is the prince of hell. Shalom.